I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Are they here? <laughs> yeah. God. You know what? I haven't had any of you introduce everybody. Can we do that real quick? Yeah. Even though they've been working and working and working, we still have an introduced them personally. Only as the Samoan assembly and not worship team. But they do have names. So I want them to like to know what they are. Hallelujah, praise God. Praise, praise the Lord. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, uh, Sister Taylor on our, our right. Um, she's our tenor. Yes. Uh, singer. <laughs> we have Sister Laura, uh, she's a soprano. She's a soprano. And uh, she's a soprano. Okay, here is a soprano. Myself, I'm Nina. I sing alto and I like a folder. So I help um, voices or... Yeah, you can say also for probably or center. But everything that we do is all for the Lord. Yeah. And we have Sister Easter, she's our leader. And we have um, our piano player, my husband, Fatu. Yes. And we have Brother Leo. He's a he plays piano, piano drums, so kinda of like Fatu as well. <laughs> so we have Brother Sam, a drum player. And this is our worship team from Psalm 1 Cornerstone Ministry, our Assembly of God. And we love to minister. Yeah. Whatever we do, it's a we love to be a blessing to others. Yes. You are. Well, we love you. Blessing to today. We had a great time. It's a blessing today, yesterday. And we thank you for having us. Oh, it's always a blessing. Please keep us in your prayers. Amen. 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 I have a question for you. Are you home to stay? Yes. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you for your prayers. <laughs> oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So they're going to bring some worship to us, and then we'll go on with the soon. As soon as they get the, the sound back up. <laughs> I know there was a power surge earlier. I was walking back in, so that might have had something to do with it. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for letting us all work out right. <laughs> oh, so, you know, I wanted to tell a testimony about our family as uh, while we're waiting on them to do that. Uh, just about a week ago, my grandson, Timothy's oldest son, the one that fell out of a tree and broke his neck in two places a couple of years ago, the same one. More, the enemy doesn't like that kid. He's been out to kill him since he was knee high. But you know what? God's faithful. And yes. this level, the last couple of weeks, he had major surgery, and the Lord brought him through it wonderfully. And I'm so thankful. The Lord is so faithful, and uh, he's doing well. And we're praising God. <laughs>
allow God to work through his spirit. Whatever is left of today, give it up to him. Give him all the glory, all the praise. Oh, yeah. I know it's been a long day, but God is here. Yes. He deserves all the praise.
thank you for your anointing, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon us, Lord. To you be all the glory, Father God. We magnify your name.
where you children. We thank you, Lord. We glorify your blessed communion. Let's name above you. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I never get tired of praising him. Oh, I just can't stop praising his name. A song like that. Just can't stop praising his name. Oh, he's worthy of praise. Oh, there's power and praise. Oh, there's so much power and praise. I think you can get a prayer answered faster by praising God for the answer than you can for asking it. Because he knows our way that we need God. And he just wants to know that we trust him and we come to him for the answers. Praise God. Oh, what a wonderful Savior. So, so at this time now, I'm going to ask Barbara to come one more time this evening and greet you. See what God has on her heart. Wasn't that dinner good? Amen. Very cool? Yes. Oh, I'm glad we're singing. We need to move a little bit. Um, God is good all the time. Yes, yes. And all the time, yes. God is good. That's right. And now is a good time. Your tummy's full and your spirit's full. It's a good time to give an offering. Isn't it? You know, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. And you know, I can't tell you enough. The more you give, the more he gives back. It just kind of flows. And all of you have had prayer for your finances. Yes, that's right. So as you are blessed, the Lord, the church is blessed. Right. And so it just it just comes around. It just comes around. We can win more souls for him. Because his coming is so very soon. Amen. 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 Oh. Good timing of the cartoon. <laughs> they always pass me these collection plates at church. So I started collecting them. <laughs> That's right. But you know what? This afternoon, I don't know if you guys saw it. I just thought it was such a good one that, uh, not this afternoon, this morning. It was, I don't understand why the, the restaurant takes 15% of my money for a tip and the Lord only gets 10%. Tell us, tell us. I like it's that. 20%. Yes, it's 20% now. That's right. So the Lord's offering or tithe should be more now, shouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Everything should be going up. <laughs> but you know what? The Lord never changes. His word never changes. The world can change. Lots of things can change, but he never changes. Praise God. Lord, we just thank you right now for what you're going to do this evening in the offerings. Lord, you know the ones that can give and you know the ones that can't. And Father, we just ask that you would bless each and every one and that you would provide what, what you have set before them. Lord, help us not to go away the same that we came tonight. Father, I just thank you for, for Dr. Johnny. I just thank you, Joni, I'm sorry, uh, for what she's doing, what she has ministered to us. And we just thank you for what you're going to do right now in Jesus' name. Amen.
I thank all of you for being obedient to the Lord. Hallelujah. Mm, that is so good. So now it's my privilege to introduce yes. Pastor Lorraine Coconado. She's come all the way up from Chadsworth. And when we met each other, it was like we were automatically sisters and brothers in the Lord. It was like automatic family. And, uh, you know, there's a few people you can meet and you're connect with, like, like we did with our pastor and sister Paige and they came. Uh, just so many of you. God makes his family because we are his family. And so uh, it's our honor to have Pastor Lorraine and Frank with us. Um, they're very busy people, very much in demand spiritually. God blesses Sister Lorraine in so many ways. She is a prayer warrior, and I do mean a prayer warrior. In fact, before she had the church, her ministry was a prayer ministry, the Leaves of Healing prayer ministry. And uh, you know, God expands on that. He loves vessels that are open to him and has that open line that Pastor Sister Jone was talking about, that open heaven. <laughs> I love that. That was neat. And so I just, I just am so honored that she was able to get away and agreed to come. And I know she's going to be a blessing to you. So welcome them as they come tonight. You love it. Thank you so much, Pastor Fonda. Thank you. All praise to Jesus. Amen. All the glory always goes to the Lord. I also want to make commentary. I have my husband here, Frank Coconato. Frank Coconato. He's not totally on. He's Frank Coconato. And we are originally from New York. We're married 42 years. Long time. We were only 10 when we got married. <laughs> but I, I wanted to make reference to what a blessing it is to just stand here with this family. Yes. Pastor Timothy is definitely our young brother, and we so appreciate his heart. I can't even tell you how much I appreciate the humility of this family, Pastor Fonda, Pastor Timothy. You know what, we've spent a lot of time together over the years, and most of it was spontaneous. Pastor Timothy would call me and say, Pastor Lorraine, what are you guys doing this weekend? I'm like, uh, I guess we're spending time with you. <laughs> so we believe in being spontaneous, and that was good. And they would come down, and they'd bring all four of the children. And you know what, we, we just, they're mushpuka, they're family, okay? That's the Hebrew word. They're family. We are family in Christ. We are family by the blood of the Lamb of God. And we are so thankful that we are here with you today. What a blessing to be up in the capital of the state of California. Wow. I don't know if you all know how vital it is that you're here. You know what? I'm going to go down, but I'll come back. You, you, can, you can keep that up there, but we're good. Um, because we went to the Capitol today. My husband's never been to Sacramento. And I said, well, Frank, we got to go to the Capitol, because I've been here a few times. And the diverse reasons I have come are very unusual, which I probably won't go into right now. But just spiritually, that the Holy Spirit of the living God would place you, you, in the capital city of the state of California, which I call California the western wall of the United States. Okay, we're going to make this a wailing wall for the glory of God. Amen. Everyone says California is falling off the, the continent. I say no. In the name of Jesus, we are the wall that wails and cries day and night. Watchmen on the wall. Oh, yeah. I just I want you to give someone a high five and say you're amazing. Oh, yeah. Give someone a high five and say you're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You know, because God 
strategically, he didn't make a mistake, but strategically placed you in the city. And the divine purposes that you're here are so beyond our comprehension in this hour. I'm literally on a personal retreat. Pastor Timothy did not know this when, when they invited me, Pastor Fon and Pastor Timothy, months ago. I put it on my calendar. But the Holy Spirit told me, I've been in church. Oh, I need to, I'm a sinner. I need to get to the altar. But I haven't been in church because the Spirit of the Lord told me to take the month of August and just seek Him. And He told me He has some revelation that He's going to give me. And I've heard some, but some revelations that He wants to speak to me. And you know, it's a fearful thing to be in the hands of the living God. And I think, Lord, okay, I've never done this. We've had a church body by God's grace for nine years. It's Tuesdays and Fridays, so we don't even have Sunday services. And the Lord told me this a couple of months ago, and I forgot all about it. Aren't you glad God brings things back to your memory? So I was talking to my son, our son on the phone, who's the associate pastor and worship leader, and I said, Todd, you know what? I've got to take the month of August off. He goes, Mom, that's extreme. <laughs> he goes, why would you do that? I go, I go you know what? I, I don't want to do it because mm-hmm. I miss being in the house of the Lord oh, yeah. with God's people. And I love just being able to worship with you today. What a great worship team. Oh, God bless you. Thank you, Jesus, for your dedication. I mean, I just want to squish every one of you, give you a big hug. But, but you know, honestly, the last couple of weeks, you know how it is. When you take time off, it's not even two weeks yet, literally, the first service, i got to tell you what happened. I'm not there. The church is all gone bonkers, okay? Where's Pastor Lorraine? What's wrong with her? Is she sick? She's not telling us something. Why is she not here? And all of a sudden, throughout the service, now, by the way, they know I know what they're doing. They're all texting me, okay? Throughout the service. (laughs) Where are you? What's going on? When are you coming back? I'm thinking, man, I don't want them addicted to me. I want them committed to the Lord. Amen? Amen. So I thought, okay, well, uh, I said, don't worry. I'm fine. All is well. Just be faithful. And I had every weird thing go on in that service. My son said to me, Mom, everything went crazy. Talk about none of the media work, okay? Pastor Todd get up to preach, no message, no this, no that. He said, Mom, everything went crazy. I go, yeah, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Just keep giving God the praise. Just keep giving Him the glory. We are not people that get hung up on the natural realm That's right. because we live in the natural but our heart yes. is seated in yes. heavenly oh, places yes. in Christ amen oh, yes. so we are not people that get unraveled I don't know about all of you in here but there's a lot of people around me that have meltdowns oh, anybody know anybody's having a meltdown right now <laughs> somebody's having a meltdown hopefully no one in here but they call me like I'm the last thing on earth. You know what I mean? Like, Pastor, I need you now. Hey, I'm having dinner with my husband. Can I finish the meal or what? You know? And and they don't think that Frank and I have a life. They don't think that we have anything to do but to kind of fall at their feet whenever they need us. And I don't believe that's why God appointed shepherds. I don't believe that because we, like these pastors right here, Pastor Timothy is one of the best pastors that I know. I'm not saying that because he's on the platform, okay? I'm telling you, he has a heart for his people. Yes. Try to find a shepherd with a shepherd's heart nowadays. You don't. You don't. They're not around. This woman is God. She loves. She loves with God's heart. And so we're not doing this to, to boost each other up right now, but literally, this is rare. This church is rare. Yes, it is. This is holy ground. God has called us to be on holy ground. So I haven't heard any of the other messages. I haven't a clue what was preached. But I know one thing. That the Lord is calling his people back to him. 
and he is weeping over Jerusalem yes, right now. Yes, he is weeping over the body of Christ yes, right yes, now. Yes, and he's wooing yes, his church. Yes, he loves his people. Yes, he yes, loves his church with an everlasting love. Yes, and we don't even understand how much he loves us. And this is really why the Holy Spirit had me come here tonight. Not that I have all the answers, because I certainly don't. We all have a portion. We all have a part. Every one of us, right? Yes. Zephaniah 3, 17. Can, can we go to the next one, please? The, the name of the message is, Who's Singing Over You? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that God has entrusted into my hands, and I don't understand this, I just go, okay, Lord. I'm kind of like one of those innocent children. When the Holy Spirit says, do it, I go, okay, I'll do it. I'm like Isaiah, send me, Lord, whatever you want me to do. Even if it's something that seems a little crazy, I'll do it. Because I know God's not crazy. And I know he has a purpose for everything. And I'm not one of those people that do charismatic calisthenics. I just want you to know that, okay? We've got all kinds of weirdness going on in church nowadays. And I told our church recently, I said, listen, we're not going to be weird in this church. We're going to be led by the Spirit of the Lord, but we're not going to be weird. Amen? Amen. We want decency and order in the things of the Lord. So with one of the things God's entrusted for me to do, and I don't do this every week, and I don't do this every day, but there's different celebrities in Los Angeles that he's entrusted me to mentor, to pray with, to bring some to deliverance, if yeah. they're willing. And others have um, moved on, moved away. You know, some of them are no longer in the industry anymore. But let me tell you God's sense of humor. We live in California, 29 years, so we're kind of grafted in the vine at this point, right? Yeah. We're from New York. And when we moved here uh, to Los Angeles, the Holy Spirit showed me something right away. I was just getting saved at that point. I thought I was going to be an entertainer because I had this person come over to me and say, I'm a manager. I want to manage you. Now, I was already in my 30s, and I had our, yeah, our oldest son was doing some acting, who's the worship leader and associate pastor. And honestly, I really didn't want to be in the business, but I thought, well, maybe, you know, if somebody walks up to you and says, I want to manage you, all of a sudden you're like, okay. So I thought, well, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So they had me get head shots. I don't even know if you know this, Pastor Timothy, Pastor Fonda, I don't even know if you know this. But anyway, so I went and I did all the stuff you're supposed to do to get ready to do that. And this is what the Lord says to me. You're not going to be in this industry but you're going to minister to the industry. I was like, praise God. We made the way of escape because this is what Todd said to me when he was 10 years old and he was on a lot of TV shows and commercials and stuff. He said, Mom, you moved me to the land of love, of lust and self-love at 10 years old. I was like, whoa. Whoa. I was shocked he even knew what that was. Yes. Now, nowadays, they know that at three years old, but that oh, was yeah. back then, okay? Yeah. Lust and self-love? I mean, I was feeling pretty bad, Frank. You know, I was thinking, my husband got a great job in Los Angeles, and we didn't really expect to face the strongholds, the principalities, uh -huh. the powers, yeah. the darkness, the spiritual yeah. wickedness. We didn't expect that the spirit of seduction is all over that city. Oh, yes. The spirit of fantasy yes. is all over yes. that city. And so we had to learn to stand against those things yes. and not succumb, not allow the enemy to manipulate us and torment us. So yes. the Holy Spirit of the living God wants you as a people of God to dive in. Mm -hmm. See, we... Some of us have only been ankle deep. Uh -huh. Some of us have been maybe knee deep. Mm -hmm. But the Holy Spirit gave us Ezekiel 47, 12 as the verse for our church. It's leaves of healing tabernacle because the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. 
And he wants us swimming in the river. How many of you can swim? Come on. If you can't swim, you can do it now. You can swim now, right? We need to swim. See, because some of us have been going like this. We've been doing the backstroke. And when we do the backstroke, eventually, we're probably going to sink after a while. If it wasn't for the Lord rescuing us. But God is wanting us to go deeper. Yes. Deep calls unto deep. Yes. Doesn't matter if you're male or you're female. Don't let anybody despise your womanhood, ladies. Oh, Don't yeah. let anyone tell you that you can't do the work of the oh, Lord. Yes. When God called me, this is what he said to me. He said, I knew you were a woman in the womb. I was like, I figured that, Lord. <laughs> Don't despise your womanhood. Mm. Don't even justify you're a woman. Just do what I tell you to do. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, you have such a sense of humor. This is within weeks of me getting saved. I was born in the Bronx, New York. Come on. Okay? I was born in the hood in the Bronx, New York. And we were from a Jewish and Italian family. My dad being a Jew, my mom being an Italian, and my mom's family was the only Italian family in all of that area of the Bronx. It was all Jewish, and they were the token Italian family there. And my mother saw my dad when she was four years old. She was playing outside. That was when it was safe for kids to play outside on the yeah. sidewalk. She was playing outside. And she goes, I'm going to marry that Jewish guy. She told her mom that. She says, you're four years old. What do you know? She says, that's my husband. Wow. Well, she married him, all right? She married him about 20 years old. They were married 58 years. They were like boyfriend and girlfriend till the very end. Oh, yes. Praise God. See, I want you to hear from these little stories, how divinely God yes. sows yes. different circumstances into our lives. Yes. He's the tailor. Yes, he is. And he knows just how to sow things into your life. Mm -hmm. Even the hard things. Because I'll tell you about some hard things. Let's go to the next the next slide, please. This is a hard thing. For a lot of us. You shall love. Let's say it together. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Can I see the next one, please? Yeah, you can hang your hat on these verses. <laughs> this is one of the biggest challenges we have as Christians. I am continually challenged to love yes. the most difficult, mm -hmm. most awesome. challenged people mm -hmm. maybe on the face of the earth. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So are you. Yes. 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 See, not one of us is any different. That's right. God says, I'm going to put you in a position, beloved sister. I don't even know who you are. But I'm going to put you in a position, and then I expect you That's to love right. the way I love. Yes. <laughs> well, when I first got started in ministry, I led a women's ministry in a church that was a four-square church. And they licensed me four years after I got saved. I was a little scared about this. I didn't know why they were doing this. My pastor <laughs> called me in. He said, he says, I want to license you. And I said, why? He goes, because I believe you're meant to preach. And I go, how did you know that? He says, because I see the gift in you. And I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, I was a little shocked. So this is what I said to him. Pastor, I so appreciate your confidence in me, but I need some time to pray. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just jump into this haphazardly because if I'm going to do it, I want to do it with excellence. Yes. I want to do it that it will please the Lord. Because if I'm just going to do this, to just do it, and have my name hanging up somewhere on some board or some 
some pamphlet or whatever. What good is that? That's right. Really? Yes. So I prayed a couple of weeks. I went back to my pastor. I said, we need to bring my husband in. He's a businessman. He's not too thrilled with me being so Pentecostal. <laughs> and I said, I don't know how he's going to take this. So we brought Frank in, because I figured he was the litmus test, okay? If he was going to say no, then I, that was an easy way for me to just come back at it, okay? <laughs> and just keep doing what I was doing. So Frank comes in, and he talks, our pastor talked to Frank, and Frank goes, yeah, I think she should do it. I was like, <laughs> I'm looking at him like, are you kidding me? Because he thought I was a nut, okay? He thought I was off the wall crazy. He never heard of people that were speaking in tongues, okay? So I sat in my pastor's office after Frank left, and I said, now, pastor, you do realize that my husband comes from a very tradi traditional Catholic background. I said, you do realize that he thinks I'm a little nuts, okay? And he thinks my mom and dad are a little nuts, and he thinks our children are nuts. So are you sure you want to license me? He says, yes. I was like, okay. As long as you know, okay? Because I want to get everything out in the open, right? I don't want to hide things. You know, we're very good at this in the church. We are so good about hiding all of our imperfections, all of our sins. We like going like this and pointing the finger, but we don't like going like this. And I decided from the very beginning, I'm going to be transparent. Yes. I'm going to share everything about my life that I've done wrong. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give me lessons to teach other people from my brokenness. I will tell you, four years in the Lord, that was 25 years ago, I was very broken. In fact, when, when the pastor would call an altar call, Pastor Timothy, I was the first one at the altar. I was sobbing my eyes out. Yes, yes. And everybody looked at me like, what's wrong with this woman? I really didn't care, honestly. I didn't care. Amen. I just thought, you know what? I'm going to grab on to the horns of the altar, and I'm going to stay here till I get healed. Praise Hallelujah. We need to contend for our healing. Yes. Our healing. Yes. Now, I'm not fully healed. None of us are. We can pretend. Hey, not. You oh, you know, okay. I'm blessed and highly favored. Meanwhile, you just had the biggest fight with one member of your family in the car. But we're so good. So good at pretending. And I believe God wants to heal that. Yes. I want to say to you, sisters and brothers that are in the house, if you're hurting, guess what? It's okay to go, I'm hurting. I need help. I need prayer. Do you know when I had a rough day, I'm the first one at the altar after I preach the message. Okay, I'm up there and I'm like, okay, come around and come on, y'all need to pray for me now. I need prayer. I don't care what anybody thinks. I only care what he thinks. I really only care what he thinks. Praise God. Amen. We're challenged to love with that kind of love yes. all the time. Yes. It's not yes. one day of the year we love like that. I had this woman years ago when I was leading that women's ministry. She was obsessed with me. Now, I love everybody, but this woman was like literally, for lack of a better word, she was obnoxious. She would come up to me and she'd wrap, I'd be at the altar praying for people, okay? And she'd come behind me and she put her arms around me. It made me feel very uncomfortable. And she'd be hugging me from the back while I'm praying for people. Oh my goodness. Now, this was not a special needs person. We have a special needs son. I understand special needs. I'm thinking, what is she doing? So I go and I tell the pastor, I'm having a big problem with her. He goes, well, you got to work that out. That's what he said to me. And I went, okay. So I, I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, have you ever thought of getting on your face for her? Have you ever thought of crying out to me yes. on her yes. behalf oh, and asking me for the love that I have for her? I was so convicted. I thought, no, I've never done that. He said, get down on your face. And I just wept 
and wept before the Lord that I didn't have his love the way that yes. he wanted me to represent him. Well, I want you to know something. The Holy Spirit completely healed that. When I saw her running toward me, I went running toward her. Hallelujah. I gave her a big hug. I told her I loved her. I, would, I really loved her. God gave it to me. Yes. I didn't have it because I was empty and I needed him to fill me. And he gave it. All praise to Jesus. Next one, please. So here's our conference verse. Let's read it together. Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That's a picture of my dad. He's in glory. But my dad loved me a lot. I was blessed to have an earthly dad who really adored me. And we always had a beautiful relationship. In fact, when I was young, I was probably one of the only ones of all my friends that would not defy my parents. Amen. My dad would say, you come home at 11 o'clock? Yes, dad, I'll be home at 11. And I was home usually early. Whatever my dad said, I obeyed him, not even knowing what the word of God said, not even knowing that the Bible says that there's a promise to that. It's long and blessed life. So I obeyed my dad. But my dad was human. He was a man. I'm a woman. I'm human. And we make mistakes and errors. I don't put his picture up there to exalt him in any way. But I want to share a little story of something that happened when my first niece turned five years old. I was 18 when she was born. She used to call me mommy. She used to call my mom mommy. And she used to call her mother mommy. She had three mommies. We spoiled her rotten. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? First grandchild and my parents. We bought her everything she wanted. I gave her all my old Barbie dolls that I had saved for years and years. They were perfect. She took off their heads. She took off their arms. She switched everything around. And I never reprimanded her because I loved her so much. So one Christmas came. Mom and I were shopping for hours. What could we find for Jennifer? We found this doll. Now, we're talking a long time ago. How old is Jen now? She's probably in her 40s. She was five years old. We found this doll, and it had everything. Okay, it had all the clothes, all the accessories. It was very expensive for back then. We paid half and half. We were so excited to give this little girl this doll. We were more excited than anything, right? Yeah. And she opened it up, and she yeah. looked at it, and she looked at us, and she said, I don't want it. <laughs> and I was like, you don't want it? I don't want it. I don't like it. My mom and I were shocked. My father started getting mad. He's like, what do you mean you don't like it? Your grandmother and your aunt got this for you. You don't like it? I don't care. Whoa. I thought, talk about defiance, right? She was like four or five years old. So... My father asked her, go sit on a seat. You know, we sent her into exile for a little bit, you know, over in a, in a corner or whatever. He didn't have her face so well, but do you know what? She says, I don't care. I like it here. Wow. I was shocked because this was a very sweet child. And all of a sudden, one day, complete switch, little girl. Well, how much are we like that with God? Our God, He blesses us yes, he does. so much. He gives, He gives, He gives, He gives. He pours into us. He heals us when we're yeah. broken. He washes us clean with His blood. He justifies us. He redeems us. He sets us free. And then what do we do? We defy Him. Then He sends us into exile. And we wonder 
wondered why we were in exile. We go, wait a minute. How did I end up here? What am I doing in Babylon? What am I doing in Egypt? What am I doing in Syria? What am I doing in these places? Instead of saying, Lord, what did I do? What am I doing that grieves your Holy Spirit? You know, this passage of scripture is the merciful part. How many of you have read all of Zephaniah? Mm-hmm. Okay, if you haven't, Zephaniah is one of the most prophetic yes, it is. books yes, it is. for now. now. Right now. For now. Right now. And I, I believe tomorrow morning I'm going to just preach script, right from scripture rather than the PowerPoint because I was going through it earlier today and I was like, oh, everything in here yes. is happening yes. now. Yes. It's amazing. And so we wonder why Israel is surrounded with enemies. We wonder why ISIS is in the United States of America. You know, a couple of months ago, it was a Tuesday night, I was getting up on the, getting into the church to preach, and just before I left my office, I see this article from the Washington Times that ISIS has a camp eight miles from the United States border in Mexico. And they are infiltrating from Mexico through Texas to the entire United States of America. Now, General Shimon that Pastor Timothy and I worked with and Pastor Hinkle worked with before we did, General Shimon Aram is a man that we had incredible training with that years, I'm telling you, this man was an Ezekiel for the generation that he lived. He was 90 years old and he passed away a couple years ago. But when I met General Shimon, it was one of those things that you think to yourself, who is this man? He sat down next to me in a church service. I was serving at the church on the way in Van Nuys under Dr. Jack Hayford at the time. I served there for 11 years before being senior pastor of uh, the church that we now pastor. And, and I was saving two seats. And all of a sudden, Patricia and General Shimon walk in. Well, I look at this man, and I said, oh, I'm so honored that you're here. And they said, can we take these seats? I thought, sure, take them. People I was saving them for didn't show up. I said, please. And I said, General, I said, when he told me he was General Shimon, I was like, I am so honored to sit next to you. And this is what he said to me. No, I'm honored to sit next to you. I was like, why would you be honored to sit next to me? And I just could sense an anointing on that man. Oh, yes. Yes. He had a call to preach to the church, not the Jews. Oh, yeah. Now, the Jews heard him plenty, believe me. Everyone else was tiptoeing around the tulips. No one wanted to say Jesus' name, okay? Oh, yeah. So they're like this. Oh, don't say Jesus. Don't pray in Jesus' name. Don't say anything about Jesus. And General oh, Shalom would get up there, sister, and she'd go, he'd go, Jesus. And the <laughs> rabbis would all practically pass out. He, he was told by God, he was told by God to get a Christian Bible. He was told by God to go meet with Pastor Jack Hayford. He said, that man loves Israel. Go and talk to him. And he did. Now, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know any of the history or whatever. And from that day, he bought a Christian Bible. That man studied scripture more than most Christians. In fact, he knew the Hebrew and the Aramaic, and he he knew all the things that were wrong and all the different versions, and he would sit down next to me and he'd go, now I want you to know blah, 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 and I'm like, oh no, that's not good. He says, yeah, this is what this means in Hebrew, and this is what this means in Aramaic, and I'm like, God have mercy on us. Let your spirit (laughs) cleanse these things. Real quick, side note. How many know that James is not the real name of that book? Anybody in here know that? James. Anybody know what the name of the book of James really is? Say it, somebody. There you go. Yaakov, Jacob. Yeah. Guess what? King James wanted his name in the Bible. That's why we have the King James. 
That's why we have James in the book of James. It's Jacob, Yaapa. So General Shimon was used by God to speak to churches all around the United States of America. He really didn't want to talk in the temples. He did. But he wanted the pastors with him when he was in the temples. He would invite all of us to go to the temples. And he would call me his deputy because I served as the vice president of that, of that organization for almost 11 years. And he'd say, well, my deputy, you need to read the scripture for me. So he'd say, I want you to go to Isaiah 62. And I'd turn to Isaiah and I'd read it. And, you know, we'd pray. And he, I always prayed in Yeshua's name with him. He never shared Yeshua is Jesus' Hebrew name, just in case. How many know what that means? Yeshua, what does it mean? Salvation. It means God is salvation. Do you know every time in the Old Covenant, wherever you see the word God is salvation, you are seeing the name of Yeshua. Every time. It, it, they're blinded. The Jewish people, for the most part, are blinded to that. They know what it says. They know better than we do. But God is removing those veils. I just want to give you a little side note here. General Shimon, in his last days, we were videotaping him. And someone said to him, so General, are you a Messianic Jew? He never said this in all the years I knew him. He said, I do what I do all for Jesus. And the tears just poured down his face. And we just all sat there turning into mush. Because we had no clue. We didn't know that he had come to know the Messiah. How many know God's word never returns void? You need to remember that. You need to know that every jot and every tittle in the word of God is going to come to pass. We are not to fear in this hour. The world is going crazy. But God is saying, praise God. And he will never, ever, ever lose his mind. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Who remembers this movie? Oh, yeah. That's still the next one. Fiddler on the Roof. Tevya. This is the husband and the wife. Do you love me? Goldie, do I what? Tevia, do you love me? Goldie, for 25 years I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? Next one, please. Tevia, but do you love me? Goldie, for 25 years I've lived with him fought with him, starved with him. For 25 years, my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? That was just a precious play. Yes. Many times redone all around the country. Recently came to Los Angeles. Let's go to the next one, please. So my question to you doesn't matter if you've known the Lord 50 years or more. Yes. Do you love him? Yes. 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 A true follower of Christ. Any servant of the Lord. See, ministers are not like in the elite of God. Right. We're all ministers of God. Amen? Amen? It's not about how much you know, how eloquent you are, how wise you are that you have great organizing skills, how pleasant your personality is, not even about your passion for souls. How much do you love him? Do you love him enough that if someone persecuted you and said, if you confess Jesus, you're dead, would you deny him? See, we, we don't realize the persecution is everywhere. Yes, it is. It's increasing. Do you know China's been praying for America to be persecuted for years? Wow. 
Guess what? It's happening. Yes, it is. Yes. Because they know with persecution comes fervency of spirit, a tenacity and a passion that we have yet to see in this country in many, many years. And see what's here? This is the remnant. This is a remnant of people that were willing to invest their Saturday, their weekend for comforts. I want to applaud you right now. Anybody want to join me? Hallelujah. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. It's not like we're telling you anything you don't know. It's just that, do we have this kind of love that he wants us to have? Because the only way we get this love is from him. Oh, yes. It's the only way. That's right. You can't buy it. You can't barter it. You can't go to the stock exchange and buy a whole bunch of Apple stock and get love. You may feel loved at the moment, but you're not. It's only temporary. Yeah. The love of God is what he's looking for in his people right now. Yes, it is. He's not looking for the most gifted, eloquent, That's right. lauded, applauded, Come on. pastor in the pulpit that people are lording and bowing to and looking to that person. He's looking for someone that will say, I love Jesus. Yes. See, we can say that, but do we mean it? Oh, do we mean it? Jesus. I was finishing a sermon one night, and I, I usually preach on the floor anyway, so I'll preach up there anyway. But, um, and, and this woman came out of the audience. No one had moved except for her. And she threw her arms around my neck. And she was so intoxicated. I mean, I was kind of getting sick. I have to tell you, honestly, the smell of alcohol kind of makes me sick. And I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. I don't want to pass out from this alcohol that she's breathing all over me. And she's kissing me and kissing me and kissing me. And she said, I just love you so much. And I'm like, why? She says, because I know you really love us. I said, praise God. Uh -huh. If that's the best compliment I've ever gotten in my life, hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't really care if I have my name in lights. I'm not really looking to have a church of 5,000. I'll be honest with you. I can't pastor 5,000 people appropriately. I want to know the faces and the names oh, and the yes. prayer needs oh, of yes. the people in the church. Because we love the people God has sent our way. We don't consider it a haphazard thing that someone is sitting in the in the chairs every Tuesday and Friday listening to us to preach the word. What an honor it is yes. that people yes. would come and hear yes. someone Amen. preach the word. So we are so honored to serve these beautiful people. Now, some of the ushers started getting nervous because they didn't know what she was doing. With me. She would let go of me. She just held on to me, frankly choking me. Okay? And I just wept my eyes out. All I could do was weep. I couldn't even pray for her because I felt her pain so much. And I knew all she needed was to have a human touch. She just needed someone to show the love of Jesus. And I said, Lord, if that's why you've called me to do this, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'll do it every day. I don't care how they smell. I don't care how many piercings they have. I don't care if they have tattoos all over their bodies, all over their head. I don't care. I'm going to love them oh, yes. with your love. Pastor Todd, our son, came home when he was at mm, probably early 20s, and he brought this young man. I mean, he was pierced everywhere, okay? This guy had earrings in every part that you could think of that was visible. And he had all black on. He had chains all over him. And he looked like he was, you know, a gang member. And Todd brings him in the house. He goes, hey, Mom, this is my new friend. Now, Todd was already working in youth ministry. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, awesome. <laughs> no, I meant it. I, no, I meant it. I truly did. I said, what's your name? He told me his name. 
And I just threw my arms around him, and I gave him a hug. And he looked at me and he said, thank you. Thank you for not judging me. He says, I messed myself up pretty bad. He says, I put these tats all over me, that's tattoos all over me, and pierced everything that I could pierce and got holes all over my body. He says, but you know what? I gave my heart to Jesus. <laughs> and I said, hallelujah. That is the best news that I've heard oh, in ages. Yes. If just one comes to the Lord like that, we need to have that passion for Jesus. It has to go beyond our comfort zone. See, we have a special needs son. Now I'm going to tell you a story I told once years ago at a retreat, and I'm going to give you the mini version. Our son Scott was sick at 20 months old, and he is developmentally delayed. He's 34 years old. He loves Jesus. He's never had sex, never taken a drug, never drank anything. He loves the Lord with all of his heart. He loves to worship God. He loves to be in church. He loves people. He has God's love so pure in him. And people have said things to me like, oh, it's so sad what happened to your son. I'm like, oh, no, you don't understand this young man has taught me to love with Jesus' heart. Because that's the kind of heart that he has. He has a heart of love. And the Lord continues to heal him little increments at a time. But Scott had a season of his life that really was driving me bonkers. I'm just going to tell you the truth. We were in Ohio visiting some friends. And there was a bird cage. Just make believe this is the bird cage, okay? And Scott stood next to that bird cage all day long. And I was very suspicious. What is he doing over there, okay? And I thought, he's, something's weird. Something strange is going on. And that was it. They talked to him. Nobody, he wouldn't talk to anybody. He wouldn't move. All day, stood by the bird pitch. So we go out to dinner that night with his family. And we were having a great time. And all of a sudden, Scott starts to tweet. Tweet. <laughs> Okay, now he had very limited, you can laugh all you want, this is a very funny story. He had very limited speech at that point. I used to call it staccato speech, okay? So he would leave a word out here, he'd leave a pronoun out, he'd leave a conjunction out. He, he obviously could talk, but not real well. So he tweeted the whole dinner. I was traumatized, okay? <laughs> tweet, tweet, tweet. Every time someone said something to him, he had that bird's tweet down like, perfect, perfect. <laughs> And I'm looking at Frank and I'm thinking, this is a nightmare. Okay, I'm thinking, what is God trying to teach us in this? Because I always say, whatever's going on, God's trying to teach us something in this, right? Well, this went on for nine months, like birthing a baby, okay? It was so bad. We would go into restaurants, we'd go to public places, and people would say to us, that kid is obnoxious, shut him up. And you know what? We didn't know what to do. Because we couldn't get him to stop tweeting in public. He always tweeted in public for nine months. That's all he did, tweet, tweet, tweet. So I called the school. I'm like, is he tweeting in school? They're like, excuse me, Mrs. Coconut, what are you talking about? I said, he's not tweeting in school? They go, what are you talking about tweeting? We've never heard him tweet. I said, wait a minute. The moment he walked in our house off that bus, he's tweeting all night. They thought I was nuts. I said, this is crazy. So I was like, done. Okay, did you ever get to a place where you're done? Okay, you've had so much torment everywhere you go, everything. It's just crazy, right? I'm glad you're all laughing and crying because this is a crazy story. So I'm in the car with my parents, and I go, Dad, pull over in that parking lot over there. i got to go in that store. He goes, why? I said, the Holy Spirit just gave me a solution to Scott's tweeting. He goes, what? So we pull up in front of a pet store. I walk into the pet store and I go to the lady, where's your bird seed? She goes, it's over there. I said, I need the biggest bag that you have. She said, what kind of bird do you have? I said, I don't have a bird. So now she thought I was a little cuckoo, right? So I said, I, I plan on bringing this bag back. She thought I was a nut. So she, you know, they sold me this big, big bag. Big, right? So he comes home from program that day. My sons have been treated like kings. I always had their food ready for them, right? So he walked in the kitchen, 
and he looks at the bowl, and I gave him a real big, like an Italian bowl, right? And I, I didn't open up the bag, but I stuck the bird seed in it, right? I put it right there. And he goes, what is it, Mom? What is it, Mom? I said, it's bird seed. He said, no, you like it. I don't like it. I said, well, if you're going to tweet, that's what you're going to eat. <laughs> he never tweeted again. <laughs> wow, crazy stuff that God does with us, right? But Scott has God's love. Scott would go up to a homeless person who has an odor that no one can stand and he'll just go right up to them and look at their face and say, I love you, I love you. And a lot of them have never heard those words in many years. That's true. So every time I think that I'm at my limit, I go, Lord, let me see something through our son. Show me how to love with your love. We have a food ministry that we've had now for almost six years. My husband leads that ministry. And we used to do it after our Friday service. Well, that was off the charts crazy, I have to tell you from the beginning. Because these people came hungry, not for the word, but hungry for food. And they wanted the groceries and they wanted to get out of the church. So as soon as service was over, it was like it was like a bunch of cattle running to the door to grab their groceries. So years later, the Holy Spirit dealt with me. Because you see, I knew from day one, I truly knew this, that it was never to be on the same night as our main service. But there were a few people planning it. This is before Frank was leading it. And they said, oh, it's going to be after Friday service, and this is what's going to happen, and this is how we're going to do it. And, you know, I'm a nice person, right? I mean, you're nice. Where's the nice people in the house, right? We're nice. And I, I was like, okay. I went along with it. But in my heart, I knew it was wrong. Mm -hmm. So almost six years later, God shows me a picture. And it wasn't a good vision. It looked like a woodchuck or a beaver or something. Chewing at the trunk of the tree. Eating the tree. And he said to me, the food ministry was never meant to be the trunk. The food ministry is a branch. And you need to change it right away. So I didn't know what to do. Because honestly, I knew I was going to get a fight to have to do this. So I go to Frank and I go, Frank, uh, we need to change the food ministry. What are you talking about? Well, we need to change it to another night. Well, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so that was the first challenge. The next challenge was I called the food bank that supplies us. I talked to the man who's over it. Sorry, we can't change your day. All the other days are allocated. So I took two weeks and I just prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And I went back to Frank and I said, Frank, the Holy Spirit is telling me we need to change it to a Wednesday. And it could be in the afternoon, early afternoon, whatever, but it can't be on Friday anymore. Because you see, the food ministry was vying with the Holy Spirit. Yes. The food ministry yes. was literally vying yes. with the altar service. Uh, the food ministry was vying with people getting saved, getting healed, getting delivered. Yes. Because people were rushing to the door and literally fighting and practically pushing each other down to get there. Oh, wow. Wow. So after... I talked to Frank, and he said, you know what? I think God's working on me. I think we do need to change it. I was like, praise the Lord. Then I went to talk to the man who runs the food bank. I sat with him face to face. I gave him the vision. When I told him what happened, he's like, Pastor, we're going to work with you. He says, don't worry about it. We're going to work this out. We have never had so many people come as we have now. There's In the last couple of months, it's gone up about 30% from what it was. These people are getting mini sermons. They're getting prayer. They're getting food. And they're starting to come to church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All for the glory of God. But we love these people. 
It's not because we're trying to do something wonderful and get the applause of man. These people are so precious. Yes. They are so dear. You know, sometimes we look at people like that and we go, man, they deserve what they get. You know, don't tell me you never said it because we've all done it. Yeah. That person really deserved that. They were this, they were that, they were a wife beater, they were a drug addict, they were a fool, they were a hypocrite, whatever we think. But guess what? So were we. That's right. So were we. And the Lord wants you and I to be that funnel of love. Where he pours it in, we give it out. Freely we have received, freely we give. Amen? Amen. Next slide, please. Lovers of Jesus, no sacrifice. No sacrifice. Keep going, please. It's too great for a heart that's on fire with love for him. Where are the fired up saints of God? Where are they? I want to know too. Where, amen, sister. Where are they? Yeah, you know, when we start the service, I don't know if it's like this here or if it's like this in any one of your other pastors' churches here. We start the service uh, usually a few minutes late. I'll be honest with you. Our worship team's in there praying and they're having a little revival in the office. And when they come out, they're fired up, ready to go. And we probably get 20% of the people there when the worship starts. And even some of the 20% are sitting there like this. Yeah. And they're looking at their watch. Yes. Like, okay, how long is this going to be? Mm -hmm. And I think, what is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? I can't wait to worship God. I can't wait to get into the house of the Lord. I can't wait to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I can't wait to give glory to God. I don't care what anyone else is doing, do you? Do you really care that the person next to you is looking at you? God bless them, but we are not here to do that. We are here to lift up the name above all names. We are here to exalt the Lord. We are here to be a lighthouse to this generation because outside those doors are some of the most broken people on the face of the planet. Yes. How many have lived in Sacramento for over 20 years? I did. Okay. How many have lived here over 30 years? Okay. How many over 40 years? Wow. How many over 50 years? That's amazing. Okay, so who's over 60 years? Anybody lived here over 60? There's still a few left. Whoa. Okay, you too. Okay. Over 70, maybe almost. I was only 14. 14 when you moved here. Okay. Do you notice a change in your city? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I haven't been here in several years. I notice a change in your city. Yes. You see, the spiritual atmosphere here is much darker. Yes, it is. Yes, People are dying yes. on the vine in this city. But where's the church filled with the fire of Mama. God, sharing the gospel of Jesus oh, Christ? Yeah. How many churches are in the city, Pastor Timothy? Do you know? Oh, several hundred. There's 74 instead of five mile radius. Okay, 74 churches. This place should be aflame with the fire of the Spirit of God. Amen. Do you know that several years ago in Los Angeles, we had the last Billy Graham crusade? And this is before I became senior pastor. They asked me to be the coordinator for the city of Los Angeles to unite the pastors. Now, at that time, there were 8,000 plus churches in Los Angeles. So they thought that I could get a bunch of these churches together. How many think you know the number of how many churches we got together from 8,000? Somebody, okay. Somebody said 200. There you go. 200 churches came together. 200 churches were able to fill up the Rose Bowl every night. Because you see, 200 churches said, yes, mm -hmm. yes. I will do this. Yes. Yes, yes, I will call the troops in. Yes, I will be an instrument of love. Yes, I will be a living sacrifice unto God. Yes. And we were so amazed. He has never preached another crusade. That was the last one. He started in Los Angeles. And he ended in Los Angeles. 
He got saved under a woman at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. She was preaching the gospel. He threw himself on the altar, committed his life to Jesus, and never looked back. See, God has very unique things he wants to do right now, sisters and brothers. Things that are beyond our understanding. Things that are beyond our capability. He wants to do extreme things in the church of Jesus Christ. See, he's not impressed with a center like a convention center with 20,000 people. Not He's not. Because guess what? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Yes, he he numbers us all. He knows the hairs on our head. He's really not concerned with that. What right. he's concerned with is you and me. He's concerned. Do we love him? Do we love him more than anything on this planet? Do we have to have something every week to fill our voids? Do we have to fan the flame of our flesh every day and go and do things? Or are we called to worship him in spirit and in truth, to exalt the name above all names, louder than ever before, being a trust in Zion, sound the alarm on that holy mountain. This is your holy mountain. It doesn't matter if you're in this church or another church. That's your holy mountain. If one, if one in every church would come up to the altar and just crying out to God before the service, I'm not talking about the pastoral staff. I'm talking about somebody who loves Jesus. What are the people that love Jesus here? Come on. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody that loves Jesus, being a little radical, you know? How do you know Jesus was a revolutionary, right? He changed the world. The early apostles turned the world upside down wherever they went. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? Do you know, a couple of years ago, I am probably the most unmaterialistic person that I know. I have nice things and I appreciate them. But we went looking for a car for me, and I was looking at a Prius, I was looking at a Kia, I was looking at, we looked at several cars. So our son, Todd, says, Mom, you need to get a Mercedes. I'm like, a Mercedes? I said, I don't want to drive a Mercedes. I don't want to be an offense to the people that I'm ministering to. He goes, Mom, what is wrong with you? He says, I can get your Mercedes cheaper than your Highlander Hybrid. I'm like, what? So I'm thinking he doesn't know what he's talking about, right? So we go to this Mercedes dealership, and I tell this man, this is all I can pay. I I gave him a limit. I said, this is less than what I'm paying now, and this is all I'm going to pay. And he looks at me. He looks at Frank. He runs our credit. He goes, you got it. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. I was was crying. I'm like, you're going to give me a Mercedes for $100 less than my Highlander Hybrid? I said, how can that be? He says, you have very good credit. I, I almost didn't want to take it home. I, I didn't know what to do with it. Honestly, I felt a little weird. See, because my husband was the executive, and we used to always want to have a nice car for him. I had the station wagons, the, the you know, SUVs or whatever. You know, I had all the, the kid cars and all that kind of stuff. But, but I wanted him to always have a nice car. I really didn't have to. I remember the first day I pulled the car up in front of the church. I was really nervous about it, okay? It's a GLK, so it's uh, the small SUV. And again, $100 less than my former car, right? So I'm pulling up, I'm like, oh my, I'm gonna get these crazy comments from everybody. And I'm thinking, a weird way. I shouldn't have thought that way. I shouldn't have said, Lord, look what you just did. You gave us a car for $100, $1,200 less a year. And instead, I'm embarrassed Mm -hmm. because I didn't want to offend somebody. So everybody came around the car that night after the service. I'm sitting there like this. Oh, no. What am I going to do? I'm offending all these people. This is what they said to me. Pastor, we're so happy for you. Pastor, you know what? We want you to have a car like this. 
We want you to have the best of everything. I'm like, why? They go, you serve us. You love us. You work for the Lord. You need to have the best. I thought, hallelujah. (laughs) Because most of my life, I've shopped in thrift stores. I love thrift stores. I've shopped in Ross. That's really my favorite store to shop in. My husband used to work for Macy's and I used to go to Ross, okay? But honestly, I never care. As long as I could find something that fit me and looked decent, I was okay, right? I love bargains. Where's the bargain hunters in here? Hallelujah. He shows us his love every single day. Day yes, of our lives. Pastor Timothy and Pastor Fonda, how long do we have? Until you're done. No, I don't want to go much longer. What? Tell me time wise. I know these people have been sitting here all day. I don't want to. Okay, well, no, it'll be it'll be way before then. All right, let's go to the next one. This is the prayer Yeshua prayed. Jesus. Let's read it together. A righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus prayed this prayer for us. How many people in here have been to Israel? Just a few of us, right? It is so hard to believe. That Jesus the Christ. Christ is not his last name. I want y'all to know that, right? <laughs> Some people say Jesus Christ, and, and they say that's his last name, right? I go, no. <laughs> Christ is the same as Messiah, yes. Savior. Yes. He's the anointed one of God. Yes. He prayed this prayer while he was still with his feet on the ground right here. For you and me. This is. This is the insignia. This is the designer label. The designer label. Of the church of Jesus Christ. That we know him. And love him. And love others. As he loved us. How well. Have we represented him? You know, when I think of this younger generation, my eyes are just, I'm just tearing already, but I I could just weep all day. Because I don't want them to inherit a world where they are living in dire persecution, distress, penniless. I don't want to see that happen. We are at the most pivotal time in the United States of America. We have not passed this way before. And God is looking for a people, for a people called out by his name, a people that will not draw back, a people that will march and press towards the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. A people that will not, hallelujah, that will not deny his name, that will not bow to the pharaohs of this generation. You know, people ask us political questions all the time. I'm not a politician, as you can tell. But I know some politicians. I pray for them, sometimes pray with them. Hopefully get to know the next president. I would love to know the next president. Why not? Absolutely. Wouldn't you like to be in the presence of the one who has their hand on the button of the nation? Yes. I don't see why not. Right, Pastor Timothy? I don't see any reason why we can't do that, Pastor Simon. Yes. But if we keep going the way we're going... There's not going to be much left for Ariana. There's not going to be much left for this young man over here. 
There's not going to be much left for the grandkids and the children that we're raising right now. We have to be a voice. We can no longer be silent. I had one of the most incredible blessings a few weeks ago. The Jewish community of Los Angeles got together on Wilshire Boulevard. Bunch of rabbis, bunch of Israel advocacy groups, and they asked me to come and speak over Wilshire Boulevard wow. and yes. over the Jewish oh, yeah. people. I was so excited. So I just get up in this little rickety platform that was kind of scary. Actually, anybody in here know who Dennis Prager is? Yes. Okay, he actually spoke before me. He's a very well-known syndicated radio host all around the country. And he's a big, huge, about six foot five guy. And that stage fell down before he got on it. And I was like, uh-oh. But I'm light. I'm thinking I'm okay up there, right? So I got up there and I declared the word of the Lord yes. over Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. Yeah. And I was giving God praise, but let me tell you something interesting. These Jewish people were all around me. They were cheering, they were clapping, they were hallelujahing, they were doing whatever, responding to God's word, yes. God's word. When I got off the platform, our son was waiting there for me because he was concerned. Because there were a lot of threats. There was a lot of security everywhere. Literally, when I stepped down from that platform, I had more arms around me like this. I had people kissing me all over my face. They were telling me they loved me. I had no idea who these people were. They were just squishing me and mushing on me. And I started weeping. And I thought, this is the way you win the Jewish people. Yes. You love them with his love. And their hearts are softened. As I was walking out of that area, this rabbi comes over to me and says, Pastor Lorraine, you touched my heart. I want you to come to my temple. I want you to speak in my temple. Can I come speak in your church? I'm like, yes, rabbi, absolutely. We high five. He gave me his cards. We're going to meet at the end of the month and talk about what we want to do. You see, it's a new hour. Yes. It's a new day. Yes. Yes. It's a new season. Yes. We are crossing over the River Jordan. We are possessing the land as a people of God. There is no more time for self-pity. Please get delivered of self-pity. Please. God needs every one of us. Now, by the way, God is completely sufficient. He doesn't need anything, right? That's right. But he's called us. Mm -hmm. And he wants every one of us to become proactive in our calling, in our purposes. You might say, I'm too old. I'm too tired. I'm too sleepy. I'm too depressed. I'm out of work. I'm disabled. I'm this. I'm that. I'm this. Guess what? I don't think he cares about that stuff, okay? Amen. What he wants is one that comes like this. Like Isaiah said, Lord, I am undone. I am undone. But you sing over me because you love me. Yes. And if you're willing to sing over me, I'm willing to dance for you. Oh, yes. I'm willing to praise you. I'm willing to do whatever you ask me to do, Lord. Lord, you pay the ultimate price. Yes. So I don't have to pay that price. Yes. So Lord, use me. Yes. How many would say that tonight? Use yes. me, Lord. Can we stand to our feet right now? We just want to lift up yes. holy hands to the Lord right now. Yes. Lord, use me. Can we go to the last, the second to the last slide, brother? I want y'all to see this, the baby slide. Keep going, keep the turn on. Who's singing over you, baby? Who's singing over you, baby? Glory to you, Jesus. 
Jesus. Oh, what a brand.